Good morning, church. It's great to see you today. Just seven days away. Guys, I hope you're ready. You got it all done, right, for your wives? I went out for about an hour and a half the other day. I'm good. I'm ready to go. And so I hope you are too. By speaking of Christmas, um, have you ever received a, a weird or unusual gift for Christmas? I remember back when I was about eight or nine years old, You know, we used to have a gift exchange every year at my grandma and grandpa's house. All the cousins, the aunts and uncles would gather together, and we'd receive gifts, share them with each other. And I received two gifts that year, eight or nine years of age. The first one was this right here. This was the gift that I received, a Freddy the Frog floating soap dish. And I remember being so, you know, disappointed about that. You know, here, what eight-year-old kid wants a soap dish for the bathtub that he's going to use? Maybe maybe once a week, right? And so uh, there was still hope, though. I still had one more gift to go, one more gift. And this isn't a preacher story, all right? This is, this is truth I'm sharing with you here. Can you believe it? The second gift was the same lame gift. I kid you not. I had to be the only kid in town that year that had two Freddy the Frog floating soap dishes. The only thing I can figure out is that Avon threw in a free gift if you bought so much merchandise. And so my aunts were thinking, okay, what am I going to do with freeloading Freddy here? Oh, I know. I'll give it to nephew Mark. You know, he'll he'll enjoy this. There was a Reader's Digest story a few years ago about a man, a young man, who said he remembers one of the strangest gifts that his dad ever gave his mom. He said it was a DVD for Christmas. Now, he said, that's... Not a strange gift in and of itself, but he said, number one, it was a rental. <laughs> and, and, and number two, he said, we didn't even have a DVD player. So I guess that would classify as a weird and unusual gift as well. And on the surface, it seems like the gifts the wise men bring are quite unusual. Uh, we've been looking, as we've had this series over the last few weeks, at the gift of Christmas, Jesus, through the lens of the three gifts that the wise men, the Magi, brought to Christ up to about two years after his birth. They come after the manger scene. Jesus is now in a house and up to two years of age. And they bring, as you might remember over the last few weeks, they bring gold, they bring frankincense and myrrh. And on the surface, those three gifts seem a little odd, a little strange, to give to someone that's a toddler, right? When you have a two-year-old that's out of control, you're like, I'll give you anything, kid, right? And you know, you become the worst parent and you're happy to be it at that moment. Here's my phone, take it, play baby shark for the 90 millionth time, right? I'll give you candy. You want a pony, I'll give you a horse for crying out loud. Whatever it is, just stop. So what the wise men give the Christ child seems a little odd. But when understood in light of who Jesus was, They're very valuable gifts, very appropriate gifts, and the gifts that had symbolic nature to prophesy who Jesus would become. We learned on week one that gold was a gift back then given to a king, and that's very appropriate because Jesus, the Bible tells us, is our king of kings and lord of lords, and our first priority is to establish his authority in our life. The second week, we talked about frankincense, and we learned that frankincense was something used in the Old Testament by the priest, even the high priest, the one who represented the people before God when he'd go into that holy of holies once a year. Jesus is our great high priest who was God in the flesh, and yet he sympathizes with us. He understands. He intercedes for us before the throne of grace. Every day, we can go straight to the Father in heaven through him. He's our intercessor. He's our mediator, the great high priest, Jesus. But then there perhaps is the, on the surface, the strangest, weirdest gift of all, myrrh. But when you open this gift and you dig through all the wrapping, you soon discover that it is the most perfect gift that could be given. Let's start by talking about myrrh, and let's understand the purposes for which myrrh was used. Now, you might remember about frankincense. Myrrh was like frankincense. It was a resin that came from a tree or a plant. It was a very aromatic resin. 
that came from a reddish gum from a low-lying, low-growing, thorny tree. And the substance from the branches of that tree, it yielded a very, very pleasant smell. In fact, it was very expensive, also an expensive spice. That's myrrh. If you look it up in the Bible, you'll discover it appears about 17 times, 14 times in the Old Testament, three times in the New Testament. And it's used in several different ways in ancient times. One way it was used, it was a beauty treatment back then. When Esther, remember her in the Old Testament, before she becomes queen, she's brought in before the king in Esther chapter 2. And here's what we read about it. It says, now when the turn of each young lady came to go into king, what's his name? After the end of her 12 months, under the regulations for the women, for the days of their beautification were completed as follows, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and the cosmetics for the women. So it was the ultimate spa experience, I guess, at one time. And it lasted a year. How's that for a treatment? Six months, lady, ladies, with myrrh. So it's a beauty product. It was also, back then, used as a perfume. Psalm 45 tells us this. It says, all your robes are fragrant with myrrh, right? And then in the Song of Solomon, the groom says to his fiancée as she rides in towards him, who is this coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed, perfumed with myrrh? So it's a beautifying treatment. It's a perfume. It was also used, thirdly, as an analgesic, as a painkiller. It took away pain. By the way, in some places in the world, it's still recommended for toothaches and sprains and minor aches and pains, and it was used that way in the Bible. In fact, when Jesus is on the cross in the book of Mark in chapter 15, here's what we're told. They gave Jesus wine mixed with myrrh, but he would not take it. He's on the cross, dying the most excruciating death, crucifixion. The Romans offer him this wine mixed with myrrh to deaden the pain. And what I find fascinating is Jesus refuses it. It's as if he saw the importance as our substitute, taking on him the sins of the world to feel every single ounce of pain, and he refused to have his pain deadened. But it's this fourth usage that we want to focus in on this morning. It was used in the Bible times in burial, in burial. The Jews used myrrh to treat the outside of the body at death. And that's the case with Jesus, too. After he died, he's buried in John chapter 19. Here's what we read. It says, Joseph came. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. And it says they took Jesus' body, the two of them, wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. And this was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. So here's what's interesting. The same substance that was associated with Jesus' earthly life is the same substance associated with with Jesus' end of life. So here's what I want you to see, the perfect Christmas gift. Myrrh was presented to him at his birth. Myrrh is presented to him and used for him at his death. And so scholars agree, and I full-heartedly believe, that this myrrh represents Jesus as the suffering servant, as the Lamb of God who was born to die for the forgiveness of our sins. When you think of the myrrh, think of the death of Jesus. Now, there's, an, there's a song that became famous over the last couple of decades, Mary, Did you know, you know that Jesus would grow up and he'd go to the cross and he'd take our sins. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would, would do that? And so we wonder at what point did Mary, the mother, know because she was given at least three hints along the way. The first one was when the angel tells Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, he says, you shall call his name Jesus, for he'll save the people from their sins. Save, it points ahead to the cross. The second hint to Mary was given just a few days after his birth when he goes, she goes into the temple and there's the dedication for the baby about eight days in and it says that there's a prophet there by the name of Simeon who takes this baby in his arms and he's so happy to see the Messiah. Here's what he says. Simeon blesses the child and it says this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and it says there's a sword, Mary, that will pierce your own soul. Boy, how'd you like to hear that at a baby recognition service? It's like, look out, this child's going to be rejected, and you, Mary, are going to feel an immense pain. She did when she stood at the foot of the cross and watched Jesus die there for us all. But the third hint is here in the gift of myrrh. 
What a thing to insinuate when the, the, the baby is just a, a year or two old. Hey, this child is going to die. A parent doesn't want to think about that. When a child is born, the parent's thinking about life and possibilities and not death, but hovering over the nativity was the shadow of Calvary. And that is the Christmas gift, the perfect Christmas gift. And you have to go clear back into the Old Testament to see it. Would you turn back there with me to Isaiah chapter 53? And as you're turning back there, let me, let me word it like this. Imagine, if you will, if I had the power to predict the two teams that are going to be in this year's Super Bowl. And not only that, I had the power to tell you exactly what the final score is going to be, who's going to win down to the, down to the exact final point. Now, that might be, you know, hey, if you're a gambler, <laughs> if that's true, I want, you want to befriend me, right? But let's imagine this. Let's just say that this world is still here and football is still popular 700 years from now. If I could predict the two opposing teams in the Super Bowl and the exact score of that game 700 years from now, that would make me a prophet. And Isaiah essentially did something very, very similar. He prophesied 700 years before the birth of Christ a very detailed account of what would take place with the Son of God, Jesus, what he would endure on our behalf. In essence, he shows us why myrrh is the perfect Christmas gift because it reminds us of the biggest problem we have and reminds us of the price, the enormous price that Jesus paid. Let's start with the problem before we see the price. The problem we have, and we start right here in Isaiah chapter 53, and it says in verse 6, it says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each is turned to his own way. We're like sheep. And unfortunately, that's not a compliment. If Isaiah said, we're all like lions, you know, we're all like eagles, okay, that's a compliment. But when he compared us to sheep, he's essentially saying, hey, we're all, no, none of us are the brightest crayon in the box here right? You can train a lot of animals. You can train a dog. You can train a bird. You can train a hamster. You can train an elephant, but you can't train a sheep. Sherry says to our mud, I mean our Maltese, give me kisses, give me kisses. And the dog is trained to just kind of kiss all over her face. You don't go into a sheep herd and say, give me kisses. First, none of them can be trained to do that. And secondly, you wouldn't want them to because sheep have bad breath. Yes, they do. Uh, you knew that dad joke was going to come in there somewhere. You know, you, you, you just, you never know. I'm just getting loosened up here. So sheep's not a compliment. All we like sheep have gone astray. Sheep were basically known for three things. They're weak, they're witless, and they're wayward. They're weak. Think about it. Sheep, sheep are, are sort of defenseless. If a coyote or some predator comes after a sheep, how can a sheep defend itself? They have no quills they can shoot. They don't run fast. They can't fly away. They don't blend in. They don't have poisonous tongues or anything like that. They're essentially defenseless. Not only are they defenseless, they don't even say to each one another, hey, you run this way and I'll run that way, and you know one of us will, will, will live. No, sheep huddle up, and they say, take your pick, whichever one of us you want, right? They're weak and witless. In other words, they don't think for themselves Sheep tend to follow the crowd. If one sheep does dumb sheep stuff, the other sheep do dumb sheep stuff too. In fact, here's a true story. In the year 2005 in Turkey, 1,500 dumb sheep followed each other off of a cliff. 1,500. You would think if you were like number six or eight or nine, and you see the first five, six, seven going, hey, I'm stopping here. But no, no, they all went over the cliff. And the bad news is 400 of them died. The good news is it was the first 400. The, the rest of them lived because they, you know, the, the 400 made a sheep pillow down there and they're just boing, boing, boing. And when Isaiah calls us sheep, it's not a compliment. Sheep are also wayward. They wander. There's no leave them alone and they'll come home wagging their tails behind them kind of stuff. Where are you going, little sheep? You know, where are you going? I don't know. I'm looking for some happiness over here. I'll buy this new wardrobe, that'll make me happy. No, just makes you go into debt. I, 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 where are you going, little sheep? I'm, I, I'm going to go over here to have this experience. I'm going to go over here to join into this lifestyle, and it'll be great. Oh, no, that'll just hurt. I want to fit in. I want, I want to just, you know, I don't want to be thought weird. I, I, I want to, what's everybody else doing? I, I, let's just follow along. Sheep are like that. When the prophet Isaiah said, all of us are like sheep, he wasn't saying, wow, we're amazing. He was saying, we need a lot of help. We get lost. 
because you've gone away from God's path and we can't get back on our own. And this isn't going to end very good. That's what he's saying. And so we read about Jesus in Luke chapter 19 that says this, the Son of Man, Jesus, came to seek and save that which was lost, wayward sheep. And some people cringe at that verse, lost? I may be a little off course. You know, I, I need some fine-tuning maybe, but I'm not lost. We picture ourselves as a little guy. He, he writes this letter to Santa, and he says, Dear Santa, there's three boys that live in our house. There's Jeffrey, he's two. There's David, he's four. Jeffrey is good some of the time. David is good some of the time. And then there's Norman. Norman is good all of the time. And then down at the bottom it says, I am Norman. <laughs> well, tr truth is, none of us are Norman. In fact, most of us struggle to be David or Jeffrey. And the Bible says there's none righteous, not even one. In the words of Jesus, we're lost. We're not 15 degrees off course where we just need to work on a few things. We're not misguided. We're lost at sea. I'm so deeply flawed that nothing short of the perfect son of God could bring me back home to God. The myrrh reminds me Jesus had to die so I could live. Jesus had to lose his life so I could find real life. Jesus had to leave his home in glory so I could come back to God. And then that brings us to the price that Jesus paid. You want to read the Christmas story? I mean, the real Christmas story, it's told right here in Isaiah. Isaiah 53, 700 years before Jesus is born to Mary. Look at it in Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 6. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. But surely he took up our infirmities and he carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. What's he talking about? The cross. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we're healed spiritually. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. That's a prophecy given seven centuries before Jesus came to earth through Mary. And here's something you should know. It's important that you know this. Myrrh was the substance that gave off its best scent only when it was crushed. Look back to verse 5 again. Look what it says. He was pierced for our iniquities, transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. You don't see that scripture on a Christmas card. We don't read that on Christmas Eve, but maybe we should. At Christmas, the head of the crib takes us right to the foot of the cross. So what this tells us is when Jesus died, you know what? It wasn't plan B. It wasn't some divine oops. God never goes, oh boy, this wasn't supposed to happen. No, it was always supposed to happen. God knew from the very beginning he would have to redeem us. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation, Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God had it in mind. There's a terrific painting by Holman Hunt. It's painted over 100 years ago. It's called The Shadow of the Cross. And it's a picture of Jesus at home in Nazareth in the carpentry shop that he took over from his dad, Joseph. I think we can bring it up on the screen. There it is. It shows our Lord laying down a saw. It's placed in front of him, and the afternoon sunlight is coming in through the window in front of him, shining on him, and it shows him sort of stretching out his arms after work, and he's looking up towards heaven. And the sunlight casts a shadow on the back wall where his hammer and his nails are hanging, and the shadow looks as the form of a cross, doesn't it? In the foreground is a woman, it's obviously Mary, and she's down on her knees and there's a treasure chest in front of her, and in that treasure chest there is gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and as she looks up at the shadow of the cross on the wall, she sees what is going to take place. And what's most notable about the painting is the author understood this was not some last stop gap measure, the cross, no, no, no. This was something that cast a long shadow throughout the pages of Scripture. And that's what sets Christianity apart from all other world religions. It sets Christianity apart from Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism. What sets it apart? It's the bloody death of an innocent victim that sets it apart. Every other world religion is, is man trying to climb a ladder to God and his good works, but Christianity alone is God descending the ladder to man. 
doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, dying on the cross, paying the penalty of our sin. When someone goes to the electric chair, we say, man, what a horrendous crime that person had to do to receive that kind of punishment. And friend, when we look at the bloodstained cross, it ought to rock us to our core to, to think about how drastic a thing, what a horrendous thing had to happen because I'm not 15 degrees off course. I'm deeply flawed by sin. I'm lost. I stand before a holy God owing a price I cannot pay because Jesus went to the cross to pay a price he did not owe. Back when our boys were young, They had walked down like they do every day to the end of our driveway to catch the school bus one morning. And it was winter, and it was cold, and it was icy. And Aaron, our youngest, had just happened to step on a slick spot, and he fell face first onto the road. And Austin rushes him back up to the house, and I'm there by myself. Sherry is gone, and all I see is this blood all over his face, and his face is all cut up. He's bleeding, and his front teeth are, are, are all out of place, and one's kind of pointing one way and one the other, and, and, and he's, he's, he's crying. Uh, did I mention the blood? Okay, yeah. And at, at that moment, I realized, you know, I, I could never be an oral surgeon or even a dental assistant hygienist. You know, I just can't. But when I started to tell that story, and I got into the part about the blood, you know what? could tell some of you maybe just we wince a little bit we cringe a little bit I wonder why I don't flinch anymore when I hear the phrase Jesus was crucified I don't grimace anymore do you one was an accidental bloody fall that was repaired the other is a voluntary bloody violent suffering with unattended excruciating pain till you die why is it there's no lump in my throat When I hear that they drove the nails into his hands, he was pierced for my transgressions. He was crushed for my iniquities. Has the story become too old? Has time and familiarity sanitized the suffering of our Savior to the point where it doesn't even touch us anymore, move us? Dr. James Smith was a professor and an author. I have some of his books in my library, and here's what he says. He says, you know, if you want to wake up from your dream, if you're tired of being cozy and comfortable, if you want to see the reality and see who you really are, then open your eyes and see the abused body of Jesus. See the flesh fly as Jesus is whipped and beaten on our behalf. Observe the meat dangling from his back, torn out by our real sin. Let your eyes fall of that dark... A thick, sticky pulse of blood oozing down in that moment in which we say yes to sin and no to him. He says, watch his body spasm with pain and shock as the spear tears its way through the muscle and the ligament. Hear, hear the wheezing strains as he fights for his next breath. His desperate love for humanity is being tacked as the dark mass of our sin slithers up and coils around his heart. Tormenting every pulse of his conscious mind with every dying beat of his heart, he writhes with the tightening grip of our real sin. Just just remember, the nails pierced his hand, but it was our sin that wounded his heart. And let me add this. If there's some area of your life right now where you've grown careless and you're playing with fire, do me a favor. Before you go to bed tonight, just close your eyes, and in your mind's eye, look into the face, the bloodied, beaten face of Jesus. So here's the wise men. They come with the myrrh, the substance used to embalm the dead, You understand God's foreshadowing what's to come on the cross. The Lamb of God would be slain for the sins of the world. And Jesus himself, here's the amazing thing, he understood that. He even prophesied that during his ministry in his lifetime. Look at this scripture in Luke chapter 9, verse 22 and 23. Jesus, the Son of Man, he's the Son of Man, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of all. And he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. And then he said to all of them, you want to be my disciple? He said this. He said, don't just say some prayer, then you're blessed and prosperous every day of the rest of your life. He didn't say that. He didn't say, you know, pray a little prayer, (laughs) salvation, and do whatever you want to do, and, you know, jacuzzi Jesus is just going to set your sins free. He didn't say that. You know what he said? He said, you want to be my disciple? you got to deny yourself. It's not about you. Then he said, you got to take up your cross. In other words, you die to yourself, you go all in, you find new life in me. And that's what happens when we come to Christ. There's a death and there's a burial and there's a resurrection that takes place. 
In fact, the Bible says when we place our faith and trust in Jesus and we're baptized in him, look at this scripture, Colossians chapter 2. Here's what it says. When you're baptized, you were buried as Christ was buried. When you were raised up in baptism, you were raised as Christ was raised. You were raised to a new life by putting your trust in God. It is God who has raised Jesus from the dead. When you were dead in your sins, you were not set free from the sinful things of this world, but God forgave your sins and gave you new life through Jesus Christ. So he said, deny yourself, take up your cross, die to an old life. And then he said this, remember what he said? Follow me. In other words, this is not a hobby. It's not an add-on. It's not something that helps us feel good while we celebrate Santa and we go to grandma's house. It's becoming flesh, born of a virgin, never sinning. And Paying the price for our sin, that's what God did as as Jesus dies. And when you understand the magnitude of his suffering, when you understand the depth of his love, when you begin to comprehend just what happens there, I, I, I just can't casually say, you know what, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I go to church when I have time and pray over the food or whatever, you know. No, when you understand that, the declaration of divine love, The only reasonable response is wholly, completely following Christ. When you understand the price of the gift, it overwhelms and overtakes your life. So the gift of myrrh reminds me the gift of Christmas. He didn't become a man just so he could live. He became a man so he could die. I like the way one author put it. Listen to these words. He swapped a spotless castle for a grimy stable. He exchanged the worship of angel for the company of killers. He who could hold the universe in the palm of his hand, he gave it up to float in the womb of a maiden. If you were God, would you sleep on straw and be clothed in a diaper? Christ did. If you knew only a few would care that you came, would you still come? If you knew that those you loved would laugh in your face, would you still care? If you knew that the tongues you made would mock you, that the mouths you made would spit on you, that the the hands you made would crucify you, would you still make them? Christ did. He willingly humbled himself. He went from commanding angels to sleeping in straw, from holding stars to clutching Mary's finger. The palm that held the universe took the nail of the soldier. Why? Because your soul is more important than his blood. Your eternal life was more important than his earthly life. Your place in heaven was more important to him than his place in heaven. So he gave up his so you could have yours. He died so you could live. So what do I do with all that? I don't know, maybe maybe it starts where it did with the wise men. They come, they bow down, they worship him, and they give him their gifts. Maybe right now it starts with, with you humbling yourself before the greatest gift of all, the very Son of God, and giving, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's you giving him your pride, your marriage, your worries, your anxieties, your future, your health, giving Jesus your addiction, your relationships, your sin, your very self, because he gave himself for you. (laughs) I love the way the poet put it. A baby's hands in Bethlehem were small and softly curled, but held within their dimpled grasp the hope of all the world. Let's pray.